In this lecture video, we're going to show how the production technology, the production function, is used to derive the firm's labor demand equation. Now, in the previous lecture video, utility was equal to the square root of consumption times leisure. Well, we're going to use that same simple function, only this time we're going to replace U with C. Sorry, we're going to place U utility with output Q. We're going to place C with K. Instead of consumption, we're talking about capital. And then we're going to replace L with E, employment. In the table below, we have, we're demonstrating that, generally speaking, the more capital and employees a firm has, the more output it can produce. When capital and employees is zero, output obviously is zero. If you plug in 100 for capital and 100 for employees, 100 times 100, and take the square root of that, well, that's 100. 200 times 200, take the square root of it, is 200. So capital being 200, employees being 200, output's going to be 200, etc., etc. Now I'm going to use the same production function to demonstrate the law of diminishing marginal productivity. Here we're holding capital constant at 400. So on the previous slide we had a scenario that represents the long run. Here we have a scenario where um, that represents the short run. In the short run capital is fixed. In the long run every variable is adjustable. So in the short run with capital being 400 we plug that into the long run production function this is the short run production function because we're holding capital constant at 400. Now, the square root of 400 is 20, so our short run production function is q equal 20 times the square root of e. Now, the reason why e is adjustable in the short run and capital is not, well, take McDonald's for example. If McDonald's is hammered during lunch, what can it do? Can it build a new grill? Can it expand its um, French fry oil pit, can it um, expand its dining room? No, but it can call people in who are not working that day to help out with the lunch rush. So the more E, the higher the firm's short run output, but that output increases at a decreasing rate. So plugging in zero, we get output being zero. If we plug E equal 100 into the production function, the short run production function, we get the square root of 100 being 10. 10 times 20 is 200. Plugging in 200 to the short run production function yields 283. Notice when we go from 0 to 100 employees, output increases by 200. When we go from 100 to 200 employees, output only increases by 83. When we plug 300 into the short run production function, we get 346. Now output is increasing by even smaller, uh, an even smaller amount. Plug in 400, the square root of 400 is 20. 20 times 20 is 400. Uh, very small increase in output. We plug 500 in, and we get an even smaller uh, increase in output for the same increase in employees. The marginal product of labor is the change in output resulting from hiring an additional worker holding constant the quantities of other inputs. Here we're holding capital constant. So the employees increase by 100. Output increases by 200. So the change in output is 200. The change of employees is 100. So on average, when we increase employees from 0 to 100, on average, when we increase employees by 1, output will go up by 2. When employees go from 100 to 200, output increases by 83. So on average, as we increase output from 200 to 283, adding one employee increases output by 0.83. Hence, the law of diminished marginal productivity. Marginal product of labor is falling as we increase the number of employees. 
increase in employees by another 100 increases output by 63 on average this means adding an employee increases output by only 0.63 again marginal product of labor is falling increase in employees by another 100 increases output by only 46 I mean 54 so on average in this range adding an employee increases output by only 0.54 units increase employees by 100 again increases output by 47 so in this range adding one employee on average increases output by only 0.47 so the margin product of labor as the number of employees increases is falling now this is what the total product curve looks like this is what Q equals um, with capital equal to 400 we're raising labor and you can see that down here when you add one unit of labor you get a huge increase in output here if you add one unit of labor you get a smaller increase in output total product curve gives the relationship between output and the number of workers hired by the firm holding capital fixed in this case equal to 400 the marginal product curve gives the output produced by each additional worker while the average product curve gives the output per worker we don't think on the average we think on the margin if we multiply each marginal product of value by the price we get the value product of labor curve this curve is the firm's labor man curve so for example if price of your output maybe you sell a bottle of water and you're selling it for a dollar well if you multiply this marginal product of labor by one dollar and you do that everywhere on this curve this ends up being the labor demand curve and we're going to talk more about that in the future now perfectly competitive firms cannot influence the price the wage or the rent the price of capital this is the unit price of your output this is the unit price of the labor that you hire and this is the unit price of capital that you acquire suppose the price is 200 the wage is 70 and the unit price of capital is 30 in the short run k is constant let's say it's constant 100 the short production function is well here capital is 100 so maybe this is back in time um, when capital is only 100 the short run production function would then be 10 times square root of e fixed capital expenses would be r times k r being 30 k being 100 30 times 100 is 3000 variable labor expenses would be the wage w times e well in the short run you can choose e so we're going to let that variable be free so variable labor expenses would be 70 times e total production expenses would be 30 plus 70 times e or 3000 plus 70 times e now revenue would be price times quantity price being 200 q remember is in the short run the short run production function is 10 times square root of e so 10 times 2000 would be 2000 times square root of e so this is our revenue equation the short run profit function is the revenue equation now the price here is 200 keep that in mind minus our total expenses so we have a parentheses here and when we take revenue minus expenses and then we distribute the negative um, we have to we have a negative times 3000 and a negative times 70 e that's why there's a negative sign here okay so the curve down here is a profit function this is the fixed expense line this blue curve is the revenue curve and the total expense line is this red line remember this is the fixed expense line this is the total production expense line this right here is the short run revenue equation.
that we graphed in the that we graphed in that uh, on that slide, and this is the profit equation that we graphed in the graph below revenue, total expenses, and fixed expenses. Now the goal of the firm is to maximize profit. So where is profit maximized? Well, profit here is negative. Profit here is negative. Profit's rising. Profit reach, reaches its maximum level when the slope is zero. At this point up here, the slope of the profit equation is zero. So it looks like graphically the number of employees that the firm wants to hire is about 204. Now if I extend that up to the revenue equation, right, and I put a tangent line on the revenue curve, notice that the slope of the total expense curve doesn't change. The revenue uh, curve's slope is changing. It's Revenue slope is higher than that slope here. The slope here is smaller than the slope here. But at this point, at that one point, revenue and total expense have the same slope. So the profit maximization rule is very simple. The slope of revenue equals the slope of total expenses. What is the slope of revenue called? We call that value of marginal product. What's the slope of total expenses? Well, it's the wage, right? The wage is why this line is increasing at a linear rate. Now, another way to write the value of marginal product is price times the marginal product of labor. So let's apply uh, equations to this rule and see if we come up with the same thing. Now this is the profit equation. Profit equals revenue minus 3,000 times e to the zero. This is just one here, so this is just 3,000. Minus 70 to the e to the one. Why do I have exponents here? Because I'm going to differentiate this equation with respect to e. That's why this was changed from the square root of e to e raised to 0.5. Mathematically, they're the same thing. This is just 3,000. A fancy way of saying 3,000, and this is a fancy way of saying, saying 70e. Now we're going to differentiate this with respect to e, and we get what? Well, we have to use the product rule of differentiation. Um, we multiply by the old exponent. We subtract 1 from the old exponent. Do that same thing here. The old exponent is 0. We multiply by the old exponent. We subtract 1 from the old exponent. Multiply by the old exponent. Subtract 1 from the old exponent. Now we're going to simplify. So we have 1,000. 2,000 times 0.5 is 1,000. 0.5 minus 1 is negative 0.5. This right here is just 0. And then we have e to the 0, which is what? 1. And 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times 70 is 70. So this equation here represents the slope of the profit equation. That equation I, was, I just showed you, that equation represents the slope. So when e is really small, the slope is positive. When e is at the optimal level of employment, the slope is 0. When e is greater than that value, the slope is negative. Okay, So there is a value for e. If e is, say, 1, uh, the square root of 1 is 1. 1 over 1 is 1. 1,000 minus 70, well, that's positive. But if E is, say, um, 10,000, the square root of 10,000 is 100. 1,000 divided by 100 is 10. 10 minus 70, guess what, is negative. Okay, so this equation is saying exactly what that graph was saying. Now, I'm going to add 70 to both sides. Okay, Remember, this is the wage. That's the wage right there. And remember what this is. This right here was just 200, the price, times 0.5. That's from the differentiation. And then 10. 
10 came from taking the square root of capital being equal to 100. So this is the square root of our capital. This is our exponent of E, and this is the price. So value of marginal product is just the price times the marginal product of labor, and that equals the wage. Okay, so over here we got we plugged in the wage equals 70. Here we're letting the wage be free. So over here we're trying to figure out what the proximizing, profit maximizing level of employment is. We're going to solve this for E. So we divide both sides by 1,000. Or actually, um, what we're doing here is we're dividing both sides by 70 and then multiplying both sides by E to the 0.5. Because e to the negative 0.5 times e to the 0.5 is just 1. Okay, so e to the 0.5 is equal to 14.29. Uh, square both sides, and you get 204. Now, that's exactly what we got graphically, right? See, with e equal to 204, that means our slope of a profit equation is 0, and profits are maximized. Okay, this over here is the labor demand equation. Now, why is that? Well, remember the firm is competitive. A competitive firm can't choose its wage. It's got to pay whatever the overall labor market is paying. If it tries to pay less than that competitive wage, nobody's going to want to work for it. And it's not going to pay more than that competitive wage because it can hire as many workers as it wants at whatever the market says the wage is. So whatever the wage is, the firm just pays it. And if it sets the wage equal, if it chooses E, so that this side of the equation equals whatever the wage is in the market, it maximizes profit. So when a firm hires labor according to this equation, it is maximizing profit. So let's graph the labor demand equation. This is from the previous slide. This is our labor demand equation. Remember the price is 200. 200 times 0.5 from the exponent is 100. 100 times the square root of 100 is 1,000. Okay, so let's graph the labor demand equation. When E is 2,500, all you do is you take 1,000 divided by the square root of 2,500. That's what this is doing here. And you get 20. So plotting that point, the wage being 20 means the firm hired 2,500 employees. Now we plug 625 into the equation. So 1,000 divided by the square root of 625 is 40. So when the wage is 40, the firm is hiring 625 employees. Now we plug in 204 employees. 1,000 divided by the square root of 204 is 70. So when the wage is 70, the firm is hiring 204 employees. That's the scenario we had in the previous slide. Connect the dots yields the labor demand equation. Anywhere on this curve represents firm maximum profit. So if the wage is 70 and the firm hires, say, 200 employees, profits aren't maximized. As they increase the number of workers to 204, profits rise to their maximum level. If they go to 210 employees, profits are lower. So you can think of this uh, curve as the top of a mountain range. Every, uh, where if we at a given level of wages, you can, you can see profits rising, reaching its peak, and then profits falling. Same thing down here. If wages are $40 and the firm only hires 600 employees, it can increase its profits by going to 625 employees. However, if it goes to 630 employees, profits fall. Okay, now recall that the value of marginal product equation um, equaled 200, the price, times the old exponent of the short and production function, times 100 raised to the 0.5 power. This is the amount of capital, and we're square rooting it. So this right here, if we ignore the negative exponent, this right here is the short and production function. Differentiating with respect to E gives us the marginal product labor equation. And then that times the price is the value of marginal product. 
Okay. So since P is 200 and K is 100, the most general form of the labor demand curve is P times 0.5 times K to the 0.5 times E to the negative 0.5. This expression in yellow is just the derivative of the short run production function. We call that the marginal product of labor. Now if we plug in a wage equal 70 and we also plug in price equal 200, k equal 100, and we solve for e we would get 204. We've already computed that value. We already know that. That's all been done already. Drawing the labor demand curve through this point like we did previously yields the labor demand equation when the price is 200 capitals 100. Now if we hold if we hold wages constant at 70 and all we do is we increase the price to 250 then and we solve for E we would get 319 and the labor demand curve would pass through this point the new one would pass through that point. So increasing uh, an, an increasing price of the company's output shifts the labor demand curve to the right. <clears throat> Now over the long run, maybe capital goes from 100 to 400. And maybe the price of the company's output is still 250 and maybe the wage is still $70 an hour or $70 a day. The new E would be 1276. And over the long run, the short run labor demand curve would have shipped out to this point here. So increasing the price, increasing capital, shifts the labor demand curve to the right. The profit maximizing firm should produce up to the point where the cost of producing an additional unit of output, the marginal cost, is equal to the revenue obtained from selling that additional unit of output. That's what you learned in Principles of Microeconomics. You choose Q star so that marginal revenue equals marginal cost. In labor economics, it's a little different. But it's similar. You hire labor up to the point when the added value of marginal product equals the added cost of hiring the worker. So you choose E so that the value of marginal product just equals W. We already know that. So we're just kind of summarizing what we just learned. In the long run, the firm maximizes profits by choosing how many workers to hire and how much plant and equipment to invest in. We have the production function over the long run. We know this is the long run production function because K and E are both adjustable or free variables. The isoquant describes the possible combinations of labor and capital that produce the same level of output. Say we want to produce 500 units. So all we do is replace Q with what it equals, 500 in this case. And then because K is on the Y axis in the long run problem, and E's on the x-axis, we're going to solve this for K. So scoring both sides gives us 500 squared equal to K times E divided by E gives us our ISO quant. ISO meaning the same. Same level of quantity all along the curve. Now this is, an, this is analogous to the indifference curve that we did in the previous lecture video. ISO quants must be downward sloping cannot intersect. Um, isoquants that are higher indicate more output. Isoquants are convex to the origin. The, they point toward the origin. They're linear or bowed or they point toward the origin. Isoquants have slope which is equal to the negative ratio of the marginal product capital and marginal product of labor. Here's an example. So we have an isoquant curve with Q equal 500. We're going to complete this table. When employment level is 200, then K would be 1250. Because all we do is we take 500 squared divided by 200 and get 1250. So we plot that point, capital being 1250, employment being 200. Now remember, output is 500 at that point. Now we plug 400 into this equation. So we have 500 squared divided by 400, which is 625. We plot that point. At that point, output is 500. And we plug in 1,200. So 500 squared divided by 1,200 is 208. So at that point, again, output is 500. 
Everywhere along this red curve, output is 500 units. Now what happens if output is increased to 600? Well, we just replace the 500 squared with 600 squared. We redo the table. 600 squared divided by 200 is 1800. So we plot that point. That point's not on the grid, on our graph. Then we do, uh, we plug in 400. So 600 squared divided by 400 is 900. We plot that point. At that point, output is 600 units. Then we plug in 1200 for E. 600 squared divided by 1200 is 300. We plot that point, and at that point, output is 600. Everywhere along this curve, output is 600. That's what we call these isoquants. Iso meaning the same, quant referring to quantity. The isocost line indicates the possible combinations of labor and capital the firm can hire given a specified budget. So C0 is some unknown fixed cost level. R is the unit price of capital, and wage is the unit price of employment. Now here I subtracted the total wage bill of the firm from both sides of the equation. And then I divide by R. So when I divide by R, I get C0 divided by R, and I get W divided by R. So the intercept is C0 divided by R. The slope is W divided by R. So W divided by R is just the relative wage, relative to the price of capital. ISO cost indicates equally costly combinations of inputs. Anywhere along this ISO cost costs the firm the same amount of money. Higher ISO cost lines indicate higher cost. So here's an example. The wage is 70, the unit cost of capital is 30, and suppose the firm has a cost of $45,840. You just plug in the numbers. C0 is 45840 R is 30, the wage is 70. Simplify and you get 1528 minus 2.333 times E. Let's plot the points. So you plug in 200 and you get 1061. 1528 minus 2.333 times 200 is 1061. You plot that point. Now plug in 400 and you get 595. Plot that point. On both these points, the cost is 45840 right? Both these points, the cost, the firm, is 45840 Plug in 600, and you get 128 At that point, firm cost is 45840 Anywhere on this line, firm costs are 45840 What happens if... Uh, Cost rise to 50,400. All we do is replace that with 50,400. Simplify. Notice the slope did not change, so this is a parallel shift in the ISO cost line. ISO cost meaning same cost anywhere along the line. Now you plug in t uh, e equal 200 and you get 1213. You plug in and you plot that point. You plug in 400 and you get 747. You plot that point. At either one of these points, firm cost are 50400 You plug in 600 and you get 280 Any At this point, or the previous two points, the cost are 50400 Anywhere on this line, firm cost are 50400 Remember, it's a parallel shift because the wage, the unit price of capital, neither one changed. Returning to our original numerical example where the unit cost of capital was 30 the unit a cost of labor was 70 and the price was 200. Our ISO cost equation was 1528 minus 2.33 times E. Well, if I plug in employment equal 200, I get 1061. If I plug in employment of 655 into the equation, I get zero. Now the cost anywhere on this line, remember, is, well, you can find it by doing what? Taking 70 times 655 plus 30 times 0 because when employment is 655, capital, remember, is 0 in the table. So the cost anywhere on this line is $45,850.
Now what happens if R decreases to 27, if the unit cost of capital falls from 30 to 27? Well, holding cost constant, holding the wage constant, we plug in 27 to the general form of the ISO cost equation and notice that both the intercept and the slope fall. Now if we plug in 200 to this equation we get capital equal to 1,179. We get when we plug in 655 into this new equation we get zero. Now if employment is zero capital 1698 way up here. So anywhere on this line the costs are what? Well let's just try computing them again. The costs now are what? 70 times 655 plus 27 times 0. So if we hold cost constant and we decrease the unit cost of capital all that happens is we get a rotation via this point. So these two lines represent the same cost. Now, resetting everything again, when the wage is 70, the unit cost of capital is 30 and the price is 200. Um, if we regraph our equation using this grid over here, the equation is 1528 minus 2.33 times E, right? Um, again, if we plug in 200, we get 1061. If we plug in 655 for E, we get 0. So we get this equation here, right? And the cost, again, this is nothing new. The cost are 45,850 or 840. 70 is the wage. 0 is the employment level. 30 is the unit cost of capital. And 1528 is how much capital would be if employment were zero and cost were 45,840. Okay, now let's ask the question, what happens if the wage decreases to 55? Well, the wage only enters the ISO cost equation in the numerator of the slope. Everything else is being held constant, cost and the unit cost of capital. So simplifying gives us this equation. Um, if we compute capital when employment is 200, capital is 1161, and then plugging in 655 gives us 327. And notice if we make E0, if we make E0, the intercept doesn't change, does it? The intercept up here doesn't change. So we get a rotation via this point. And the cost on this red line are the same as on the black line, 45,840. Suppose now we're going to do the long run cost minimization problem. Suppose marketers and economists in your, at your company say you'll be able to sell 500 units of output in, I don't know, 10 years. And wages relative to your unit cost of capital won't change. So we'll just assume 70 and 30. Okay. Now, what the firm does is it takes this ISO quant as given and then it chooses basically the ISO cost line. Now, at this point here, the firm can produce 500 units, but it costs this amount. Same thing this point here. Can the firm be better? Well, first let's ask how much does this point cost here? Well, the wage is 70 and employment looks like about 204. With a unit cost of capital being 30, capital looks like it's about 1180. So this anywhere on this red line costs the firm $49,680. Well, can the firm be better? Well, anywhere on this line, the firm is spending less money, but anywhere along this line does not allow them to produce the 500 units of output or the 500 units of output. On this ISO want, the firm is told it can produce 500 units and sell 500 units. 
So how much does this line down here cost? Well, with a wage of 70, it looks like at that point, labor is 204. When labor is 204, it looks like capital is about 834. So nowhere on this line cost the firm $39,300. But nowhere on this line can the firm produce 500 units. It is the line that is just tangent to the isoquant that the firm wants to be at if it wants to produce 500 units of output. So at this point, the firm is uh, hiring 327 workers, roughly, and it's acquired, over the long run, 765 units of capital, which cost the firm $45,840. So if the firm wants to be on this ISO quant, it can choose this point, but its costs are going to be higher than at this point. It can choose that point, but its costs are going to be higher than at this point. It could lower its cost to this line, but it's not producing 500 units. Now, why is that important? Remember, over the long run, there are no long-run economic profits. Employment here is 327. Capital 765. What is output? Well, output is 500. 327 times 765. Take the square root is 500. Now, the reason why firms want to produce 500 units is because, in the long run, like I said earlier, long-run economic profits are zero. So let's compute what the price must be if the firm is producing 500 units of output and is minimizing its cost. Profit, remember, is price times quantity minus cost. Costs, in this case, are 45840 Long-run profits, like I said, are zero. The price, we don't know yet, um, and the quantity is 500. What we want to know is what the firm's output is being sold at. What must be its price over the long run. It's got to be such that this uh, equation holds true. So we add 45,840 to both sides. Then we divide by 500. The price the firm is getting must be 91.68 over the long run, which is why firms typically cozy up to government officials. They and politicians both know there are no long-run profits. The least cost choice is where the ISO cost line is tangent to the ISO quant. That means the marginal substitution equals the relative wage, wage divided by the unit cost of capital. Profit maximization implies cost minimization. Typically, in the long run, firms cost minimize. In the short run, they profit maximize. Now, the firm can sell 500 units no matter what K and E are. The competitor firm is a price taker, not a price maker. In other words, 9168 must be the price in the long run because the firm is making no long profit. Hence, firm revenue is 45840 no matter what K and E R. On the highest ISO cost line, the firm would lose $4,400 because costs were $50,280. On the lowest ISO cost line, the firm is unable to make 500 units. On the just right ISO cost line, the firm breaks even because costs are $45,840. The wage rate drops, two effects take place. These are analogous to substitution and income effects in utility theory. The firm takes advantage of lower price of labor by expanding production. This is a scale effect. Q can be increased at the same cost. Firm takes advantage of wage change by rearranging its mix of inputs while holding output constant. This is a substitution effect. Okay. Suppose the wage falls to $60 per hour. Remember, from that one slide, where we just changed the wage. If we change the wage and it falls, that means the firm has more consumption possibilities, more allocative possibilities. The wage falls means it can employ more workers at the same cost if it doesn't have any capital. If it doesn't have any workers and it keeps its capital constant, its costs don't change. So the black line and the red line represent the same level of cost. Now, why does output go up? Remember, when the wage falls, that means the firm's marginal cost curve falls. 
When marginal cost curves fall, that means the firm's supply curve moves to the right or increases. Recall from Principles Microeconomics that a competitive firm can sell all at once at the market price. So what happens here? The firm will increase its output by hiring more laborers and acquiring more capital over the long run. In this example, the firm hires 74 workers and acquires 780 units of capital over the long run. The cost of doing this is the new wage, 60, times the new level of employment, 374, plus the wage, 30, times the new level of capital, 780, 45,840. That's the same cost. Why is that? Well, the wage fell. Okay. Now, firm output is what? Firm output is 540. Remember, in a competitive output market, the firm can sell as much as it wants at the competitive price. And since wages fell, its marginal cost curve fell, so its supply curve moved to the right, meaning it will pr want to produce 540 units of output if wages fall to 60 and the unit pro cost of capital is still 30 and the price is $91.80. Profit here now is $3,607.20. Okay, the long run demand curve for labor um, is a relationship between wages and employment from short run period to short run period. Initially, when the wage was 70, the firm hired 327 employees. When the wage dropped to 60, the firm increased its number of employees to 374. This red dot represents the solution in the short run after the wage fell to 60 and the unit price of capital is 30 and the price was still $91 and what, 68 cents? Now the long run labor demand curve is from short run period to short run period when a wage change is triggered. So the long run labor demand curve is represented by this blue line. When the wage falls, the marginal cost curve falls. And for a firm, the marginal cost curve in perfectly competitive markets is the firm's supply curve. So if marginal costs are falling, supply is increasing. And a firm can sell whatever it wants at the competitive price. Hence, output's going to go up here. Thus, the isoquant shifts from Q0 to Q1. Now, the firm is going to choose this point here to minimize its cost. So, the firm's going to end up hiring more workers over the long run and acquiring more capital. Now, the reason why these two lines don't intersect, as they did in utility theory, is that, remember, here we're talking about an output effect caused by a lower wage. So that drop in the wage shifts quantity way out as a firm is able to sell whatever it wants at the price determined by the market. You could come across a case where this isoquant is down here, and so this iso cost line would be down here. So it just depends on how big the output effect is. Now to decompose the total effect into substitution and scale effects, we have to draw the hypothetical ISO cost line. And the hypothetical ISO cost line is parallel to the original ISO cost line. And you, and you push it up until it's just tangent to the new ISO quant. So this point here represents the hypothetical optimal solution. This is the original optimal solution. This is the hypothetical optimal solution. The scale effect is from the original optimal solution to the final optimal solution. So the firm will hire this many employees based on a scale effect. Notice what happens to the number of, or the units of capital acquired. It goes up two. So on the output effect, when quantity is higher, both capital and labor increase. Now the substitution effect is 
the fact that labor is much, much cheaper relative to capital. Remember, capital is being held constant here, and the wage is falling. So when we move from this point down to that point, we're holding output constant, but we're saying, well, that level of capital is fine and all, but uh, it's too costly. It's too costly to be at this point. We need to be minimizing our costs down here. So rather than having, you know, I'd like to have this much capital if the wage hadn't fallen and I had this level of output, but the wage fell relative to the price of capital. So the firm will move from this point down to this point. This point minimizes the firm's cost at the new wage given the old unit price of capital hadn't changed and the new level of output. So that move is a substitution effect. Now the curvature of the isoquant measures the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor. Intuitively, intuitively elasticity of substitution is the percentage change in capital to labor given a percent change in the price ratio. And the price ratio will be in wages over uh, the real rate of interest. So elasticity is the percent change in the capital labor ratio over the percent change in the relative wage. Okay, this is the percentage change in the capital labor ratio given a 1% change in the relative prices. So this will end up being some number like say 0.5. Okay, 0.5 divided by 1 would mean uh, the percent change in the capital labor ratio would be 0.5 if relative prices of inputs increased by 1%. Okay, so this is interesting uh, application of uh, inputs. Now, this would be a short-run problem because we have number of blacks working for a firm and the number of whites working for a firm. And if the firm doesn't discriminate, if the firm just picks black labor and the quantity of white labor to minimize cost, then the firm would be right here. Okay, A discriminatory firm will hire fewer blacks than it than what is optimal because maybe they just prefer to hire whites instead. This re represents a higher cost. So the moral of this story is firms that discriminate based on race or gender are not maximizing profits hence they're more likely to go out of business. So the moral of the story is the free market, a free market will punish firms that discriminate. You're not going to be in business very long if you do this. Now, affirmative action program can encourage the discriminatory firm to minimize its cost. Okay. However, a free market will do just that. Now, people will argue, what about during the era of Jim Crow? Well, if you remember, politicians specifically Southern Democrats, imposed Jim Crow. Now, I read somewhere that Greyhound did not like imposing government-mandated Jim Crow in the South. Why is that? Well, when it entered a Jim Crow state, Gen uh, Greyhound would have to stop its bus and make sure all the black people sat in the, in the, end of the, the back of the bus and all the white people in the front of the bus. And then, as it drove, drove deeper into the South, when it had to pick up black and white passengers, it took time to make sure all the white passengers were in the front and all the black passengers were in the, in the back. And we know in business, time is cost, costly. So Greyhound was not able to maximize its profits because it had to comply with Jim Crow. What that says is the free market will punish a firm by lowering their profits, by maybe making them generate a loss in the short run. And it was government that imposed the Jim Crow. Given the elasticity of sub substitution between black and white labor, that determines how bowed the isoquant is for black and white labor. And, and suppose, for example, uh, the, in the region of this country, uh, a colorblind firm uh, is hi hiring relatively more whites, maybe because of the shape of the isoquants 
or maybe it's because of the differences in wages. So the, the colorblind firm doesn't really care. The colorblind firm is trying to minimize its cost to maximize its profits. Now this might be a situation where um, the firm is located in maybe northwest California or northwest LA and maybe there's a very small black population there but this firm maybe it's just hiring in the immediate area so the firm has a lot of white workers relative to black workers now the, the situation might be reversed if this firm was located maybe near Inglewood or Compton it'd be reversed but somebody that doesn't really understand economics would look at this firm and say, hey, why do you have 80% white people and 20% black people? That's just wrong because LA is more racially diverse. Well, the firm is just trying to minimize its cost, right? And maybe the uh, black workers that live a distance away don't want to drive all the way to this, this firm and work. Okay, so there might be another reason why a firm has 80% white and 20% black workers. It might have nothing to do with, um, with race, gender, or um, ethnicity. So um, a, a politician who wants to politicize this issue might say, hey, you need to hire more black workers. So affirmative action can have consequences. So the politician says, you must hire more black workers, we're going to sue you for discrimination. We're going to make sure you get sued for discrimination. So this t form of affirmative action can do what to the firm? It can cause the firm to not maximize profits. This action it can actually drive the firm's labor cost up to the point where it might go out of business. Now let me ask you this question. If this policy uh, tells a profit maximizing firm to change its mix of employees to more represent the entire city of LA is it a wise thing to do to do that if the change in employment mix creates a situation where the firm is actually now losing money what do you think that firm's going to do well that firm might think about relocating to a country where they don't really care they just want their jobs so this firm had hired maybe 100 black employees and maybe it had 700 white employees it wasn't doing it because it didn't like it didn't want to hire black workers it did because maybe that was uh the 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 uh, ratio of whites to blacks in this part of la as a result of the intervention by government the firm is faced with much higher cost because maybe um, it has to help shuttle workers in from Compton or something. I mean, that's not that's not too crazy because that was either proposed or enacted or talked about in the San Francisco area where firms were going to shuttle workers in um, to the job site. So for whatever reason, the costs go way up. Maybe the maybe the firm has to compensate uh, black workers coming in from South LA, South Central LA, um, to maybe attract them, right? Or maybe they have to go recruit at North Carolina A and T, a place that creates really high quality uh, business graduates who happen to be black as well. So whatever for whatever reason, the costs go up. And those costs go up now maybe this firm is losing money so why would this firm want to stay in LA where it's gonna lose money so um, if the government had intervened there were 100 black people working after the intervention maybe the company goes to Mexico or China now those hundred black workers that were working in in this firm are not out of work so affirmative action can have consequences as well the consequences being it might drive businesses to relocate to other countries. Okay, now we have different isoquants. We have capital employment here 
in this situation, capital and labor are perfect substitutes because their isoquant is linear. So you can think of this. You can think of capital being robots, maybe robot welders, and E, e being actual human welders. And maybe one robot can do the work of uh, two uh, human welders. Okay, so if you need to weld 15 car frames, or uh, say 200, or you need to weld uh, 200 car frames a day, you might need 200 human welders. Well, you can you can get that same output if you had 100 robot welders. So in this situation, capital and labor are perfect substitutes, and their isoquant is linear. Okay. That level of that capital labor ratio gives you the same output as 100 over 0 or maybe 25 over whatever this is maybe 150 Hence the firm can substitute two workers with one machine and not see its output change Now we have another kind of isoquant we have L-shaped isoquants L-shaped isoquants are uh, in mar in labor markets or involve technologies where you need uh, humans and capital in fixed ratios. For example, an airplane. You fly a plane from LA to Chicago. I don't know, you need two pilots and maybe three flight attendants to make that flight. So one plane, three flight attendants, or maybe uh, it's a smaller plane you need two pilots and two flight attendants so if you want to make five flights you need five planes you would need four times five employees all right now if you chose to um, if you chose five planes and then you hired maybe a few extra people you're still going to be able to make those five flights which is why most small commuter jets usually have two pilots and maybe one flight attendant at the front of the plane and one pilot at the end of the plane the firm then gets the same output when it hires five machines planes and 20 workers as when it hires say five planes and 25 workers